I'm Bodine Sanders, producer and host of Blueprints. Blueprints is a program where we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion from a positive perspective. And we interview incredible guests, leaders across industries. And today we have a special, special guest. I refer to her for full transparency purposes. Uh, I am in love with our next guest. I call her and refer to her as Queen Gotti, Rosa uh -huh. M. Gotti, consultant, retired ESPN senior VP, communications counsel and corporate outreach. Um, I can talk all day and talk about her accomplishments. Rosa has been a pioneer at ESPN in the cable industry as a woman in sports and communications. I, I met Rosa many years ago uh, while she was still at ESPN and I developed a level of respect for her and we've been friends ever since. So allow me to introduce to you Rosa Gotti. Hello, Rosa. Hi, Bodine. Thank you so much for that. Well, I remember listen, that meeting. Um, that, remember that's just a little bit of your bona fides, your accolades. Um, mm -hmm. You volunteer, you volunteer for a number of nonprofit organizations, um, Boys and Girls Club up in Connecticut, right? Yes. Um, the Jimmy V Foundation. So you've done so much. So my question, and I always open up with all my guests, the very first question, give me your blueprint for diversity, equity, and inclusion from a positive perspective based on whenever, however you want to approach the conversation. Again, I, and I can't believe I forgot this one. You are 20, a 2021 Hall of Fame inductee for the College Sports Information Directors Association. We have our first Hall of Famer as a guest. So with all your experience, Give me your blueprint on DEI. Oh, wow. Um, gosh, Bodine, you know, I have to always look back. Uh, Jim Falvano said, you have to always remember where you came from. And growing up in Drexel Hill, my parents were involved in the church and they were always volunteering um, for the nuns and the priests. And I grew up looking at their example uh, of doing things for others. So that was the beginning of my, uh, of my thinking of respect for others and helping others, uh, which I then carried on throughout my career and built at ESPN with corporate outreach. Um, and so in, uh, in Drexel Hill too, I, we would play sports all the time. We didn't have the devices. So we were out playing every day whether it was tag football, which was really, uh, you know, more like tackle football, baseball, you name, we were playing all kinds of sports. So I developed a love for sports. Um, and then I worked at Villanova and after I graduated and I um, was acting, they made me acting director because my boss left in the middle of the football season and they didn't know what to do with me because no woman in the country was doing sports information at a major university. Um, but I had a meeting with Father President, Father McCarthy, and we discussed it and I wasn't going to get the job. But after our conversation, he really respected me and thought I deserved a chance. So an Augustinian priest gave me the chance to enter into the field of sports public relations. Um, I was already doing it as an assistant, you know, secretary assistant. And then um, Skip Head Brown University called me and uh, I took the job there for four years. And while at Brown in the last year, we were hosting the NCAA Men's Frozen Four and ESPN was starting out and televising the event. And the producer and the founder of ESPN were there and they recommended me uh, to the president of ESPN, and I started ESPN. So DEI, I was experiencing what it was like to be the only woman in the room in the meetings. Um, 
comments, subtle bias, very direct, um, uh, you know, discrimination aspects. So I was experiencing some of that and learning how to deal with it because we didn't have a blueprint. As you say, blueprint is a great word. We didn't have a blueprint when I was growing up and for a woman and how we should be. Um, My mother would say to me, often when I was down and in tears, my mother would say to me, Rosa, roll with the punches. Roll with the punches. And I think that helped me to survive. I took things less seriously, less personally, and I was more proactive in uh, giving my viewpoint, how I felt about things. So I learned to do that for me and to succeed. And I stumbled along the way. Now at ESPN, we are already have diverse commentators on the air. And uh, I'll never forget, um, Stuart Scott came to me and I was head, I, I had started the diversity committee at ESPN and he came to me about some issues he was dealing with and I helped him um, in that regard. And he never forgot that. But I started to think about what it was like for an African-American male to come into the company, what it was like for Hispanic, Asian, disabled. And so I really started to put my heart and soul into what must the feelings be like for someone else? Well, let me just take a step back because I'm learning from you and (laughs) you highlighted or at least you you talked about some of the things I should have highlighted. So let me take a take a step back. No, 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 no. Let me take a step <laughs> no, back and give you your flowers. In 1992, you founded the ESPN Diversity Committee that you just spoke about. Um, so that gives you a level of experience to talk about DEI because as we as I know and as you know, DEI is not about one singular thing, meaning it's not about just race. It's about everything. We don't talk about uh, diversity in the banking or financing industry, right? And that that word doesn't mean diversify your, your holdings. That doesn't mean diversify your holdings of people. It means diversify your holdings of what you're investing in. So diversity is not a bad word, right? So it is not. It is not a bad word. Um, I'm sure you've mentored many people, men and women. Um, I've read articles. Will Sheridan wrote a nice article about you when you were inducted into the Hall of Fame. I read that article. Um, Mm -hmm. So let's talk about folks, your experiences mentoring different folks from different backgrounds, because that's a part of diversity as well. It is. It's, you know, it's, a, it's unfortunate because things have gotten so skewed where diversity is like there are negative connotations. And really, it, 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 all it is is about and it's so important. It is about everyone and respect for everyone. So back in 1992, when I was starting that committee, I tried to think of every possible uh, category, if you will, and I had, I wanted to have young and old, all different people of color, Native American, um, I mentioned disabled. I also, at the time, people who were gay did not, were not coming out at that time. But I made sure that I had someone who was gay on that committee, even though the rest of the committee members did not know it. And so I wanted to make sure that everyone was at the table. And that is critical. Mm-hmm. And whether it also religion, I wanted to make sure I had someone who was Jewish. So we must take it back to what diversity really means. And it's all different. Con- the differences where people grew up is a factor. Um, how what their culture is like. Um, so we cannot discount all those aspects of a person's history. I'm the perfect example. You know this. I'm the perfect Mm -hmm. example. Someone who grew up in the deep south that most folks refer it to, grew up in Florida, um, migrated up north um, to the main line and had the opportunity to experience diversity. If it wasn't for my teammates, 
I mean, I don't know where would I be, right? Because I grew up being coached by all black men, having all black teammates. But once, and then I started at Cheney University, for those who don't know, the oldest HBCU in the country. Then I transferred to Villanova. You know the story. Um, yeah. But my teammates at Nova, specifically my defensive back teammates, they had a level of diversity that I didn't have. So they were able to help me mm. navigate this new environment. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't mean white teammates. I mean, white and black teammates. I had guys from Norristown who, mm -hmm. who grew up Catholic. I didn't even know that they were black Catholics. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no idea. Right. So I'm talking South, about right. uh, teammates from black and white teammates who had diversity growing up and they were able to help me. Let's talk about because, again, I'm I believe in the power of sports. Let's talk about how sports is a great example of of leading the way for diversity. Oh, goodness. That is such a great point. I want to say, first of all, I met you at, at a cable event and really was impressed with you. And we exchanged cards and then you reach out to me and and we became friends. And then when you came out with your book. I was so impressed. I'd learned so much. It's a beautiful story. I, anyone who is watching this, you really need to buy Bodine's book because it really gives you the journey of someone who came from a totally different world into the world of Villanova. It's a great story and it's told so well and so positively. There's so many lessons in your book. Sports is probably the best vehicle for diversity and the history of diversity in this country. So you just rattle them off. Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Arthur Ashe, um, Billie Serena Jean Williams, King, Billie Jean King, Billie Jean King, Serena Williams. Um, you, you just go on and on and on. Special Olympics, the beauty yes. of Special Olympics. Um, so sports really helps society accept other people who were different from them. I, I would even go a couple of steps. I would add Brian Song, the movie, which is based oh, yes. on the book, I Am Third yes. by Love Gail that. Sayers about his relationship with Brian Piccolo. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we, we talk about life imitating art, art imitating life. Let's talk right. about the blind side. Let's talk about, remember the Titans. Those are all oh. historical, uh, uh, well-written books that are true stories. So, um, you know, it's easy for me to talk about sports and how sports is a great way to build relationships. But mm -hmm. you've seen it from a business perspective as well, right? Mm -hmm. Having, yes. being on that campus, right? I, I mean, I've talked to, you know, Ed Pinckney, who was on that campus at, at some point, right? What was that? Matter of fact, when we when we were introduced to each other or when I walked over to you because everybody in the auditorium was afraid because everybody was saying, that's Rosa Gotti, that's Rosa Gotti. I walk over because I'm a Villanova grad and you introduced me to Tim Kirchin. He was funny. And remember, he told the story about him and Ed Pinckney. Um, but let's talk about that campus, how you were able to, um, I would say, mold or mentor that campus where folks valued each other and yeah. valued each other's differences. Yeah. See, that's what we're losing today. The dialogue, understanding each other, listening to each other and not being afraid. I'm you. You were brave and you came up and talked to me. You found out I'm a regular person, right? Um, the Heron brothers, when Rolly Massimino became coach, there was Larry Heron and his brother, a year younger than he, Keith Heron, were two of his uh, players. And so when I was traveling with the team, I'm with black and white. We're in Niagara Falls. <laughs> And I go to a diner to have something to eat, this, this short white girl and woman at the time. And, and I'm with two, you know, 
six four, six six eight black players and people. It's a fully white diner, all looking and what's going on here. And and um, you would get those stares. And I think the thing is to say, okay, these people just aren't accustomed to seeing this. And and be forgiving. Don't don't walk around and be angry about that. Say, okay, how can I help them feel comfortable? How can I help them feel comfortable with this? So uh, Keith and Larry, I'll never forget, we're standing in line waiting for a plane to, to board a plane. And from the back of me, and this is going to sound a little crazy, maybe to some people, from the, from the back, Keith Hurran touched my head. And I went, I turned around. He said, I'm sorry. I just wanted to feel what your hair was like. <laughs> he wanted to see what my hair was like, right? I said, okay, let me touch your hair, you know, because he was more in an Afro. like, And so I touched his hair. That sort of broke the ice of that situation. Not to be offended, but I kind of understood. he. <laughs> this was nothing, this was not an inappropriate gesture. Right. So really understanding people, l- listening to people, giving them the benefit of the doubt, having a conversation about what it's like. When we when we started the diversity, so at, at Villanova, often being the only woman in the classroom, because I was in the first class of women at Villanova, uh, there was a nursing school, but I was in the first class of women. And I think that sort of foreshadowed my future career to be that only woman in the room. And it was intimidating and scary, but I tried to like act like I wasn't afraid and and reach out to people. So I mentored a lot of people, yes. Um, And it's all about listening, listening to their experiences. So, you know, when when we started the diversity committee at at ESPN, I made a major mistake. I was very gung-ho analytically. All right. Okay. How do we do this? How do we recruit diversity? How do we onboard people? Orientation for these employees. How do we promote people? What are the biases in consideration of people and how we promote them? I wanted to go through the whole lifespan of an employee in the company, right? So I had all these goals and objectives. Well, the first meetings we kept diverting into storytelling. Each of the employees wanted to talk about experiences in their department, how it was working, how they were treated. So I'll never forget an African-American male said to me, Rosa, you don't know what it's like for me in New York City, walking down the street and I pass a woman and she clutches her purse. I'll never forget that. So these stories started bubbling up, and I realized I I can't go and build objectives until people could talk about their experiences. The emotions had to come out, and I had to reverse everything. But I also had to set parameters. I said, look, you cannot bring up a boss's name. You can talk about your experience But if you have an issue with a boss or it is discrimination, you must go to human resources. And if you don't go to human resources, I will go to human resources because I'm an officer of the company and I have an obligation to report any discrimination. So you can talk about your stories so that we can all learn from them. So we then started building documents that were about standard stereotyping, uh, individuals by their category, by, you know, their ethnic background, whatever it might be. And um, and that was beautiful because that was the sort of anecdotal and relationship, which you're so good at, Podine, um, the understanding people it, and, and then build, then do the objectives and the goals. And uh, it was a fascinating experience. But having had the Villanova experience, all those experiences that I learned, you know, to have a conversation about and not walk away and not go up. Oh, he's a jerk. Sitting down saying, do you understand what you just said, how that can be interpreted? Do you, under- do you understand that? And trying to carefully and 
delicately explain why what a person said could be taken in different ways. Well, two questions I have left before we wrap up. One, if you if you have any opinion on um, Title IX, because we're right around 50, 51 years, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. That's what, correct. What progress have you seen regarding Title IX? I think it's a good thing. It is a good thing. Uh, Title IX came out when I graduated from Villanova in 1972. Um, the, um, it took a long time for schools to adopt it. There was a lot of resistance, huge resistance. And uh, as far as getting... Uh, the, you know, the women always had their practice at an inconvenient time. So they had to learn how to rotate schedules so the women's basketball team could also have, you know, prime time. Uh, the, uh, lockers, um, you name it, uniforms, so on. It took years to get colleges, and it took lawsuits, actually, to get colleges to adapt to Title IX. Great progress has been made, yes, but there's still more progress needs to be done. It takes a long time. And some people get frustrated with the amount of time it takes. But I try to say to them, think about this. For hundreds of years, women had a different role in society. Women were at home having the children. That was the role. By the way, that's the most important job in the world, is women raising their children. That is super important. We discounted that role. That was wrong. But Hundreds of years, society was so conditioned to that. So now it's not going to happen in two years and five years and 10 years and 20 years. It, it takes time for the pendulum to swing. So the pendulum was up here. It came down to center. And now we're getting a little we're getting out of whack here again. We are. And we've got to get back to where both sides talk. Otherwise, our society is destroyed. Yeah, there's no silver bullet, but we have to make the effort. My, my next question, I think, is going to be a, more, a little bit more lighthearted, um, talking about how winning helps with regards to um, moving in the right direction. If you're winning... That means the team is accomplishing that goal together, right? And mm -hmm. then those just on the outside, those who are rooting for the team, those who are part of family members. I mean, let's just talk Villanova, right? I'm a Villanova yeah. grad, you're a Villanova grad, right? The, the, I, I think the viewers will appreciate it. Winning helps cure a lot of <laughs> It, some people might say mask, but it helps bring a lot of people together. I've yes. seen it when we won that first championship in 1985. I was a freshman. We've just recently won. The Nova football team won a championship in, in 09. The two other recent basketball championships. I've seen the campus come together in winning. You've yes. seen it as well. Let's talk about that. Well, when I was at Villanova, we had a lot of losing seasons. Um, when Rolly came on board, those first two seasons uh, were more losses than wins. Um, winning, and you're, there's so many thoughts and, and stories in my head that as you say this, winning and everyone getting together and cheering for one team, one cause is exhilarating. And people hugging each other. Uh, some of the best national examples besides Villanova, uh, the women's soccer team. Look how women's soccer really elevated. Look how men got behind women's soccer. I remember back in time talking with Donna Lopiano, who is a major force in, um, in equality for women. Um, she was head of the Women's Sports Foundation and we would have conversations. How are we gonna get more change? How are women's athletics gonna be accepted? Um, she said a very important thing. The key will be the fathers at their daughters' games and the fathers wanting their daughters to have the same opportunities as sure. their boy, getting the scholarships, getting equal treatment in travel, whatever it may be. And she was absolutely right. So what happened, you had girls now starting to play because of Title IX, more girls playing sports, 
grade school, high school, so on, get to college, University of Connecticut, perfect example. There were family. a lot of men would go to the men's games. Families were buying season tickets for UConn women's basketball. And uh, Gina Oriem is from, uh, is from Norristown. And anyway, you, so Title IX then gradually, with girls and women getting, more, getting scholarships and playing, their fathers were there at the games, their grandmothers, their, so on. So... Um, Sports brings people together. I, but I would also say winning, yes, winning is celebrating, but you learn more from losing. You learn more from your character. You learn for your character. You learn more that when you fall down, getting back up. So you can be on the winning team and lose that last second shot in the final four, and you're, you are so dejected. But that is the biggest challenge to you as a person uh rising above so so winning is fantastic bringing people together but losing so i know i i mentored many people who were unhappy on their team they did they weren't happy with the coach i said let me tell you you're going to have a difficult boss in your career <laughs> so if you can't learn to adjust <laughs> you know you're going to have problems later too my final question queen Gotti. what are you hopeful for in the future regarding DEI? I am hopeful that people just talk to each other and share and share their experiences and that people speak from the heart and that people have empathy and say, gee, I want to understand what it's been like for you. I want to understand that. So dialogue, it's one word, dialogue. It's simple. Absolutely. Keep it simple. Well, Thank you, Rosa Gotti. Thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, it was wonderful to see you today. And uh, folks, um, I, I wanna say, this is the type of conversation we need to have, a positive conversation, getting different perspectives from different leaders in the community. And uh, that's what this show, Blueprints, intends to do. Rosa Gotti, Queen Gotti, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Bodine.